of Romans tonight. The book of Romans, Riley Butcher approached me during the day camp and said, Brother Craig, what's your favorite book of the Bible? It's like asking what my favorite food is. I don't know. I got a bunch of them. Uh, Romans is definitely one of them. I enjoy it. Romans is packed with doctrine, packed with information that we learn about God. We learn about our position in Christ, and we use and we learn to understand about how the Christian life works. And it's a very wonderful book and uh, one of my favorites to read behind. I love reading about behind Paul, the Apostle Paul. Yes. Apostle Paul was an educated man, very smart, and God took and used that for the furtherance of the gospel. So I'm thankful that we get to benefit from that. Yes. But we're going to be in Romans chapter number 8. I spoke with Pastor just briefly before the service. He says he loves you all and misses you. Yes. And I can't wait to get back, but he's having a great time with Preston. And so I'm thankful for, for the opportunity to stand in the pulpit and preach tonight. So we'll be in Romans chapter number 8, and frankly, we're going to be going over the entire chapter. I don't intend to sit and read the whole thing in one take because it's, it's loaded with information. So we're going to work our way through it steadily, and I'll have you out here at a good time. The Bible says in verse number 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And that's going to be the beginning point for the message, who we are in Christ Jesus, who I am, who are you in Christ Jesus. And let's pray. Dear Father, as we start this message, Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your power and your word, your spirit, and I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and that nothing I do would hinder this message and that they would, this church would be helped and benefited from your word as we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we think about who we are in Christ, if I were to ask you, who are you in Christ? What has God done for you? We'd have stories we could testify of what God has done for us. But I say, who are you in Christ? How does being a child of God make you any different? When God looks at you, what does He see? What do we find here? The wonderful thing that, we, that he, uh, the Apostle Paul starts this chapter off with is there is therefore now no condemnation. And the first thing I'd like to draw our attention to tonight as we consider who we are in Christ Jesus is that I am not condemned because of my sin. And that instantly puts me in a great mood as I read this, this passage in this chapter. I am not condemned for my sin. He says in verse number one, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's a wonderful truth to know. And I thought about what does condemned mean? Can you think of a building that was condemned. When, when I went to college, we had a dormitory that was uh, condemned. No one was allowed to be in there. I never went in there. I was a good student. But I know people that did go in there. And, it was a, and they told me what it was like. He said there were uh, uh, plants growing inside the building. Uh, there was a bunch of old furniture that really was just put in there because they didn't have a place for it. There was a bunch of rodents and bugs and cobwebs. It was condemned. It was not up to the standard of living. It was condemned. And I think about my life. Is my life often uh, up to God's standard of holy living? As I think about my position in Christ, would he look at me and find anything to condemn? It's possible that he would. But I'm thankful that because I stand in Christ Jesus, I'm not condemned for, what, for my sin. Because when the Lord looks, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ when he sees me. Those that are in Christ desire to walk after the Spirit. He says there at the end of verse number 1, um, though, uh, There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those that are in Christ Jesus desire to walk after the Spirit, their mind, their goal is to do whatever the Holy Spirit leads. You see, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live with inside our hearts. And He leads us, and he, he moves, and there's impulses, and He speaks to us, and He works. He's an actual person. He's not just an indicator. He's not just your conscience. He is God Himself inside of you. And God wants to lead you and move you. And the Bible says that those who are seeking to not walk after their flesh, their own desires, but just seeking to walk after the Spirit, those are the people that God leads and God, that God works with. God has enabled our walk to change. When we think about it, before we were saved, before I was saved, I had a lifestyle that was probably pretty good by some world standards, but compared to God's standards, was not good enough. Right. It wasn't good enough for me to go to heaven. It wasn't good enough for me to lead any Anybody else to Christ, my lifestyle in and of itself was a lost person, and I was doing what all I could to be good. I actually thought, you know, I, I'm probably going to be good enough to go to heaven. I come from a good home. I go to a good church. I'm a good person. And as I grew as a young person, I realized that I would never be good enough. God has enabled our walk to change. You look at me in verse number two. The Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, 
and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Is your desire tonight to walk after the Spirit, or is it to continue living in the flesh, living according to your own desires, your own instincts, your own plans? I think about my plans. I'm a, I'm a young parent, young, newlywed by some standard. I've got plans. I've got things I want to do, places I want to go and I want to accomplish. I want, my, I want to accomplish for my children, for my family. And I think about my plans, but do my plans line up with God? Better yet, is the Lord giving me those plans? Is He leading me? Do I have a desire to walk after the Spirit or am I walking after the flesh? The Bible says that when we walk after the flesh that we're headed on a path towards destruction. Heading on a path towards a life that doesn't count anything for the Lord. You think we've heard of, of other believers that have gotten saved, but they never grew. They never per, uh, continued to grow in the Lord and follow through with their commitment to the Lord. And they followed after their flesh and they live a life wasted. I don't want to do that. I hope that you don't either. May we desire to live according to the Spirit. Not only that, but look with me now in verse number five. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Not only does God change my walk, but He changes my mind. And that's how He changes my walk, honestly. You think about it. I can make myself walk a certain direction, go a certain place, make a certain thing happen in my life. But honestly, the Lord's after my mind. He's after my heart. That's what He's after for each and every one of us. He's after our minds. And the verse says in verse number 5, For they that are after the flesh do Mind the things of the flesh. You see, wherever you're, whatever you're thinking about is what you're going to walk towards, which, the direction that you're going to go. So what's on your mind tonight? What's on your mind as you think about life in general? Uh, it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. We sing that song, it's a great thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. But is it really? Are we truly desiring to walk and follow in the footsteps of Christ? We walk, not after not, we walk after what we think about, and what's going on in our mind affects our direction. Our mind is affected by God's Word and the lack of God's Word. Look in verse number 7. The Bible says, well, verse number 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse number 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It says literally that if you are not spending time in the law of the Lord, the Bible, if you're not spending time reading it, that you are literally just casting off any concern that God's word has on your life. You're saying, I'm not bound by it. I'm not obeying it. I'm not following it. I will live life as I see fit. And when we do that, we're living according to the flesh. But, you know, as I think about it, the start of the chapter, the wonderful thing is that I'm not condemned. When we look at this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's a wonderful thing to know that I'm not condemned, but it's a sad and shameful thing to think that my, my life isn't consistent with that. That I still live a condemnable life, but I'm taking advantage of God not condemning me. And far too often my life is there, and I dare say many other Christians are as well. And not only do we see that God wants to change my walk and He wants to change my mind, and as He changes my mind, it's going to affect my walk, but our mind is affected by God's Word and the Holy Spirit. He talked about the being led of the Spirit. And then verse number 4, those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In verse number 9, verse 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, no matter how hard they try. Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. God makes it very clear. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives and abides inside of you. And if He is inside you and He dwells inside you, you are in the Spirit. Why would we want to live and operate as if we're not? Why would we be content to live a life that is being led by the flesh? Why does that happen? It's because we are shutting out our, our mind. Our mind does not welcome in the things of God from His Word. And our mind doesn't welcome in the direction and the impulses and the leadership from God Himself living within inside us. But I'm so thankful that I stand, I'm not condemned. I pray that my life would be honorable to him in that way and that my behavior would be changed. Read on with me if you would. Verse number 10. And if Christ be in you. Remember, I'm taught, this message is about what, who we are in Christ. But when Christ is in us, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, 
He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. God gives us a plan of action to address the areas that make us live an inconsistent life, a life that is not being led by the Spirit. We're not following after the Spirit. We're following after the flesh. He says you need to mortify the deeds, mortify the deeds of the body. You know, in the previous chapter, Paul is talking. Now, Paul is one of, he's a super Christian, right? Paul is one of the best. In verse, in chapter uh, number seven, the very end of it, he says, when I want to do something good, I go do something wrong. And when I, uh, I don't want to do something wrong and I'm trying to do something good, it just never works. I find then a law in my members that when I go to do good, I don't do it. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he's saying in my body is something called sin. We all have a sin nature and I deal with it. You deal with it. We have a sin nature that weighs us down. And for us to have victory over sin, the Bible says we need to mortify our body. Mortify means to kill, put it down. But the beautiful thing is that as we kill our body, the things that are um, going to uh, conjure up sin and sinful desires, flesh, as we suppress and put down our flesh, God, the same God that was able to raise up Jesus Christ from the dead, is able to resurrect our body and bring life. And it's a wonderful thing to know that as I put myself down, God will raise me back up according to his will in a way that pleases him. I'm so thankful that as I think about who I am in Christ, I'm not condemned. As I think about walking in the spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh, I'm not very good at walking in the spirit all the time. But I get great joy out of knowing that I stand not condemned. I am not condemned as I think about it. When he looks at my sin, he says he's still not condemned. He sees a desire is there a desire in our hearts to live a life that is walking according to the Spirit? Now look with me if you would in verse number 15. Not only do we see that in Christ I am not condemned, but I am adopted into the family of God. Verse 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. As I, when I think about the Lord saving my soul, saving my life, I'm thankful to know that he is not just a God and I am a creature that he has created. He is my father and he sees me as his child. The Bible calls me a joint heir with Christ. That's some pretty high status. I, I'm, not, I don't, I, I'm not saying I'm equal with God, but I'm getting the equal inheritance that Jesus Christ got. That is amazing as I think about my position in Christ. Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm a guy that messes up on his Christian life all the time. But the fact that God looks at me and sees that I am one of his children and he loves me and he's going to... Uh, see me as an, an equal heir with Christ. And the, the, I love this part right here. Look with me if you would. It says... Where was it? It was in. Oh, we haven't gotten to it yet. So just stay tuned. <laughs> so you see, God desires to be a father to us. And that's a special thing. And that he wants our embrace. You know, that, that verse there that says we don't have the spirit of bondage again to fear. We don't have a spirit of bondage. We've been in bondage to many things, haven't we? We're, we're in bondage to those things that are addicting. We're in a bondage to those things, those things that we just feel like we can't get out of. We have a heavy responsibility perfect. We feel like we're bound. We are, we are tied to something. We're fastened. We're, we're handcuffed, if you will. But God says, that's not how I want you to see me. He says, I don't want you to take on, you're not, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He said, he doesn't want you to be bound. He wants you to embrace him. Today's my dad's birthday. He's my dad. I love him. If I asked my dad to come up here, he would want me to give him a hug. But what I wouldn't want him to do is to hug me and take me everywhere he went. It'd be a little awkward. Last night we were out soul winning door knocking over here in the neighborhood. And uh, I'm teamed up with him. I don't always get teamed up with my dad. And as we're knocking on doors, he says, hi, Craig Howard, Craig Howard. I'm like, people are going to think we're lawyers. <laughs> and then he changed it over and he's like, Craig and Craig. And I'm like, I think that's a, there's a, like a, a band named Craig and Craig. So what, whatever it is, but I love my dad. And my dad loves me, and, but I think about it, you know, God the Father and with us, he doesn't want us to feel bound. If my dad, like, grabbed me everywhere, this is my son, and, like, held me onto it, the relationship would be so much strained. 
That's not the way it should be. He's, he wants us to come to him and want him and to embrace him and cry, Abba, Father. That's how he desires for us to feel and to approach him. We're adopted. We're adopted. The Holy Spirit confirms and affirms our position in Christ as his children. It says so in verse 16. This is great because if you're, I had doubts. I had times where I doubted my salvation. Sure. Shortly after I got saved, I got saved as a 16-year-old boy, and I hadn't even made it a, an entire year from the time that I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I was dealing with some serious doubts. I think it's even common for many new believers in Christ to doubt whether or not they are really saved, that it really happened. But it's a wonderful thing to know in verse 16 that the Spirit itself, the Holy Spirit itself, beareth witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. That's one of the greatest confirmations I know, and the affirmations I know, that I am a child of God, that I am saved, that the Holy Spirit tells me I am. That's a wonderful thing to know. And we're heirs of not just what God has to offer, but in verse number 17, this is the goodie that I was waiting to tell you. If and if children, then heirs, heirs, what's the next word? Of. We're heirs of God. Not heirs to God. He's going to give us a home in heaven, which he is, thank the Lord. But we are heirs of God himself. We are heirs of everything that is embodied in who God is. God is good. Amen? Amen. We are heirs of that goodness. God is love. Amen? Amen? We are heirs of that love. We are heirs of the righteousness and the holiness that is in him. We are heirs of God. And then he says, not only heirs, but join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. And I struggled when I look at that passage. I'm like, all right, all this stuff sounds great. I'm not condemned. I'm, a, I'm adopted. I'm part of the family of God. And then you talk about suffering. What in the world? Where is that coming from? Why is he saying that we need to worry about suffering? Just, just read on with me. So verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature also, itself also should be, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. The Bible speaks in another passage in Philippians that it, it, those that have received Christ are pretty much signed up to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. But it's a wonderful thing to know that when they're suffering, he says it in verse 18, you know, I reckon. It means I calculate, but we use I reckon all the time around here. I reckon so. It says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In us. God is going to do something special. If you are suffering today, there is some sort of suffering that God that is happening, God's going to use it. God takes suffering and He does a great work and He reveals His glory, not ours. We have no glory. God reveals His glory in us. And so when we think about God revealing His glory in my suffering, my suffering becomes worth it. Because it doesn't compare to the glory that God has and God's going to bring and reveal to me when I step from this life into the next, but also the glory that he reveals to those around me when I think about what he's going to do with my suffering. It's a wonderful thing to know that I'm a part of the, the family of God. You know, families, they suffer together. Right. They go through things together. They, they, they have the same ups and same downs. Uh, I was talking with my brother today and talking about a sibling of ours the same way. And so he's like, yeah. She wasn't like that when we were growing up. And we just sat there and we, we were uh, going through the same suffering together, if you know what I mean. But, you know, families go through these things together. I'm thankful to be a part of the family of God. And so we have a, a, a hope of a glorious future. You know, he says in verse number 20, So for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. And so when you think about hope, you know, we, we were created to ultimately and in the end realize that our world all around us, everything's vain. If you read Ecclesiastes, you'll see that you know, the world is pointless. Nothing is, nothing is good. It's, it's all a waste. If you keep God out of the equation, that's true. But God says, I want you to realize that the world around you is vain. And when you do, the hope that I offer you is so much sweeter. It's so much more precious, so much more uh, 
you know, appealing to us. We desire that hope. And that hope is of eternal life and life with Jesus Christ as we uh, pass from this life to the next. Now, look with me if you would. Verse 24, the Bible says, For we are saved by hope, but that hope, the hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I haven't seen the Lord. I haven't seen heaven, but I have my faith placed in him. I have hope of eternal life because of what God's word says about the Lord loving me, seeing my sin, dying for my sin, and offering me a chance to go to heaven, an opportunity to receive him. I'm thankful that I have. And if you haven't received Jesus Christ, you can have hope and guarantee of eternal life today. That's a wonderful thing to know that we have that and we can wait with patience for it. But not only am I not condemned for my sin, not only am I a part of the family of God, and there's some really great benefits tied into being a part of God's family. Let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. I am also helped with the struggles of this life. This is going to be the verse that is probably the best known out of Romans 8. So look with me if you would in verse number 28. Actually, look with me in verse number 26. The Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's a great verse. It's a wonderful verse to know that we know all things work together for good. But if we're not careful, we'll take that verse and say, all things work together for good. That doesn't, you're missing the end of the verse. The end of the verse says, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But you also have to look back at the previous verse. It says, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You see, what God does is he can work all things for good according to his will. God has a will for your life. You may be going through something that's un- unfortunate, unpleasant, undesirable, uh, just stinks. You don't like it. You're ready for it to be over. God can take all of that and work it out to be something good according to his will. It may not be what you had in mind. You may have said, I, I have something else that's going to, if this would be gone, it would make my life better. And this is, a, this is exactly what I want. But God may be working something to, according to his will. See, help is available when we pray. When we pray. Some people lack the help that they need from God because they don't pray. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I don't pray very, uh, as much as I should. And when problems arise, I think of what I've got to do to fix it. But the Bible says in verse 17 is that, uh, I'm sorry, not verse 17, verse 26, there it is. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray. We know not what to pray. We don't know what we really need. We don't really know the answer to our situations. But that's when the Holy Spirit steps in because it says, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with, which, with groanings that cannot be uttered. He sees exactly where we are and exactly what we're dealing with. And he knows really what we need to be asking and he helps us pray. He helps us get to it. You know, some of the sweetest times of my Christian life have been in prayer. Pastor Sexton up at Temple Baptist in Crown College, he, he says that your prayer life is your Christian life. And I think that's a direct reflection of it. If you don't, you don't spend any time praying, what kind of a relationship do you have with the Lord? And as we need help, we all need help. No, there's not a person in here that would say that they don't need help from the Lord. They don't need help with the day-to-day struggles and things that we face. Help's available when we pray, and God has promised us that he'll intercede on our behalf. And as we think about God interceding and praying on our behalf, God's help that he gives when we pray will always bring us to his will. Don't try praying for God to help lead you out of his will. God's not going to answer that prayer. You can go manufacture something on your own, but God's help always leads us into his will, always leads us closer to his will. Everything that happens in this life can be used by God to bring us closer to his will. Even a bad thing can be used to bring us to the very best thing that he has, and the best things are always found in his will, which is where we're supposed to go, and that's where we fulfill our purpose. So as we think about it, I, who am I in Christ? I'm not condemned. I'm a child, and I have access. I have his help for the struggles and the weaknesses and troubles of this life. But also, who am I in Christ? I am given, I, I'm given a purpose and worth. I'm someone of value to the Lord. I'm someone that has a purpose, a goal to accomplish, something to do. 
I have reason to be here. I'm not just a child that he loves and he's like, here, have fun on earth. He's got a plan for me and for you as well. As we wrap this up, look with me in verse number 29. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, them he he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not... How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is God, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, and also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm so thankful for what I have in Christ Jesus. I have his love. I have worth. I have a purpose. That's what I have. That's who I am in Him. See, God knew my purpose before I was ever born. God knew long before any of that that He had a purpose and a plan to get me to His purpose. And the purpose of my life is to give Him glory and obey Him in whatever capacity He leads me to. This is done as we are conformed to His image. It said in verse number 29, "For, For whom He did foreknow, He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. That literally means everybody that has ever existed, it is God's plan for them to become more and more like Christ. The, the, the process to become more like Christ starts with salvation. Receiving the Lord is the gift of salvation that He offers to each and every one of us. You can't be like Christ until you receive Him. You receive the fact that He died on the cross for our sins. If I want to become more and more like Christ, He has to change me from the inside out. The Bible says in a, in a verse higher up in this passage that I can't please him with my flesh. I can't make it happen on my own. For me to be conformed and shaped and molded to be more and more like Christ, and that brings him lots of glory. For that to happen, he's got I've got to receive him on the inside. I have to accept that he died for my sin. I have to accept that I'm a sinner in need of him to die for my sin. And he died for my sin. And I receive him. I place my faith and trust in him to take me to heaven when I die. And it starts with that. God knew exactly at one point I would receive Him. He didn't make me receive Him. He extended the opportunities. I had many opportunities growing up in this church to receive Christ. But on a Monday night during a revival meeting, I got saved when I was 16 years old. And I'm thankful for what God is going to do. And I want to be conformed to His image. As I think about how much He loves me, reading that passage, there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. And the fact that He loves me that much makes me want to love Him and respond to Him that way. See, God extends the invitation for us all to come to Him, and those that come are justified. It doesn't say forgiven, it uses the word justified. Forgiven means you've done something wrong, I acknowledge it, and I, I agree to wipe it away. Or I agree, agree not to hold it on against you. Justification is so much better. Justification says it's not even there. I don't even acknowledge it. It's gone. Because when God sees me, He doesn't see me in my sin. He sees Jesus Christ. The Bible says those that he called, he justified. I was called. You've been called to receive Jesus Christ. And when you receive him, you will be justified. When we're justified of sin, there's nothing the devil can do. There's nothing the devil can do to keep us from the Lord. There's nothing he can do to keep us from our home in heaven and from the relationship with him. He's going to try to trip us up. There's nothing he can do. We belong to the Lord then. Those that are justified are later glorified. I'm thankful that I have a home in heaven. I'm thankful that one day I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to be up in heaven. It's going to be glorious. And it's going to be amazing to look at what God is doing because His glory is that great. As I read this passage, I thought about it. God's investing in us. God's invested His Son. The most valuable thing, person, most valuable anything that God had was His Son. And He gave His Son for me. For you, God gave. He invested that much. There's nothing else more valuable to him than his son, Jesus Christ. And if he's willing to give him for me, there's nothing else more valuable than Jesus. So if everything else is less valuable, what would God not give to me? 
to help fulfill the purpose that he has for my life. And my, the purpose is to bring him honor and glory. God values us because he values his son. We stand justified. There are legitimate accusations that the devil, my peers, anybody that knows me could make against me. But I'm thankful for that verse, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's anybody that's received him. Who can lay an accusation or a charge? God justifieth. It is God that justifieth. I stand justified, and that just gets me excited. The one who is in position to condemn me, to look at my life and say, you don't measure up to what you need to be. Verse number 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. The one that can condemn me is speaking to God on my behalf. And then verse number 35, who shall separate us? From the love of Christ. Who? What? Is there anything? Anything I do? Anything that happens to me? Anything that would make me less attractive to God? Anything that I do that makes me just be an embarrassment to God that would make Him not love me anymore? Is there anything? No. We are more than conquerors with Christ and we have His love that will never be separated from us. Christ's love is inseparable. We are loved and empowered to fulfill our God-given purpose and all of it is in Christ Jesus. So who are you in Christ Jesus? Who are you? What has God done for you since you've received him? Ah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, my sin is, con, is not condemned. It, it's set aside. There's no condemnation on me. I'm the child of God. I belong to him. He's got a purpose for me, and he is going to help me with the struggles and the, the infirmities and the difficulties of my day-to-day life. I'm worth something to him. I'm worth something, and he's got a purpose for me. All of that is who I am in Christ, and that's who you are if you've received Christ. If you bow your heads and close with me as we, we conclude this message, I've talked to you about what Christ has done for you and what he's done for me. And in the middle of the message, once or twice, I've mentioned that you need to receive Christ. If there's someone in this room here tonight, as every head bowed, every eye closed, that has not received Christ, you're, I'm not a, you would say, I'm not a Christian. I have not place my faith and trust in Him. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and take care of that today. We had young people that received Christ during day camp, and there's adults in this room that might need that as well. You have the opportunity to receive. As the, muni- as the music plays, we're going to have an opportunity for you to come up and pray. And if you'd like for someone to talk with you, we have folks here that would be happy to present the gospel and show you how you could know for sure that you have a home in heaven. You want Christ to change you from the inside out? It comes with each and every one of us receiving Him first. Christian, how's your life? If someone, if God looked at your life, would it condemn? Would it be condemnable? Are you walking after the Spirit or are you walking after the flesh? What are you putting in your mind? Are you putting God's Word in your mind? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit? As we all stand, we have an opportunity to come and pray if you'd like. I just want to, maybe you want to come up and thank God for the opportunity to be in His family. Thank God for the adoption that we have. All the benefits we have being part of the family of God. Maybe you're struggling with something. We know that God can take all things and work them together for good according to His will. Dear Father, I pray for these folks. I pray for our church. May we all desire to be exactly what You want us to be in You. I'm thankful for everything You have given to us in You. May we be conformed to Your image. May those that are lost receive You trust you as Savior. May we understand that you help our infirmities. May we pray and seek your face. May you help us to live according to the Spirit, not the flesh.